All right, well, welcome back to Multigrid Methods. We're in Chapter 5. We're talking about the basic building blocks of Multigrid, and I'm going through a bunch of assumptions about uh, various pieces that are typically involved with our Multigrid methods. Um, what we completed our very basic discussion, and now we're on to talking about um, the what what the Galerkin conditions look like in uh, in this very basic abstract framework of multigrid. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but I'll just do a quick reminder of what we've already touched upon. So we said that uh, the multigrid method satisfies the strong Galerkin condition that is assumption A zero if it satisfies the wrap condition for all of the family of stiffness matrices that we that we are interested in. Uh, remember, we're, we're given the, the problem that we want to solve is the problem on the finest level, A, L, U, L, E equals F, L, where L is the level number. So this is some number like four or 10. F is a given vector called the forcing vector. U is the displacement vector that we're trying to figure out, that we're trying to uh, solve for. And A is a stiffness matrix. So this can be fairly abstract. In, in other words, this does not have to be the stiffness matrix that comes from a finite element method. Here in this section and the next couple of chapters, we're going to talk about uh, kind of abstract things. And again, the idea is we're given F and we want to find this exact solution. So we have this family of stiffness matrices, A, L, and these are all SPD for L between zero and capital L. And so we say that they satisfy the Galerkin condition or the strong Galerkin condition if they satisfy a wrap condition, where this is the restriction matrix and this is the prolongation matrix. Of course, this is the relative coarse matrix, and this is the relative fine matrix, stiffness matrices. We say that the weak Galerkin condition holds, or equivalently assumption A1 holds, if and only if this condition holds. So we went through last time, and we showed that assumption A0 implies this. So we won't go through that again, but that, that was the idea. To do that, we we proved a couple of things along the way. Namely, if, if we have the strong Galerkin condition, then our coarse grid Ritz projection matrix is a, an actual projection. It satisfies pi L tilde squared is equal to pi L tilde. And no matter what, even without assumption A0, um, pi L tilde is self-adjoint, that coarse grid Ritz projection matrix. So we proved this last time. We won't go through the proof of that. Of course, if that's all true, then um, I minus the coarse grid Ritz projection matrix is uh, self-adjoint. And by the way, this star means that's the um, that's the the um, the adjoint matrix with respect to the energy inner product. And the energy inner product is the inner product that looks like this, U, L, V, L, A, L, which is defined as A, U, L, V, L, L, where this means the level canonical inner product. Now, we don't, um, so we do have a level canonical inner product in this case because our spaces are so simple. Um, remember our finite, or our not finite element, but our spaces are just R and L. And each one of those is paired with a canonical inner product. So this really is this really is the inner product of the in the standard Euclidean sense on this space. All right, so it always holds that based on our definition of the pi L tilde matrix, that I minus pi L tilde is self-adjoint. And if the strong Galerkin assumption holds, then this uh, operator I minus pi L tilde is a projection operator, meaning that if you square it, you get the same thing back. 
And then that allowed us, those those preliminaries allowed us to show that uh, the strong Galerkin uh, assumption implies the weak Galerkin assumption. So we showed that last time, and that's where we ended. Now we want to come up with a new condition that unfortunately doesn't have uh, a good name that we can associate to it. So let's just uh, get into it. We say that assumption A2 holds, and by the way, by this, we mean that, or when we say something like this, we mean that assumption A2 holds for the entire multigrid algorithm. So assumption A2 holds if and only if for all U, L, and R, N, L, and all levels, except uh, the zero level, that I, L minus pi, L tilde, that's the error in the coarse grid risk projection matrix against U, L, U, L, in the energy inner product A, L is always greater than or equal to zero. So this assumption actually is not anything new. We basically established this one before because it's entirely equivalent to assumption A1. So in a previous proof, in fact, it was the proof of the last lemma, we showed using only the definition of the pi L minus one and the pi L tilde matrices that this difference, so we showed this in the proof of the last lemma that this difference here of these two uh, energy inner products was exactly equal to this. So we won't go through that again. It was a, uh, some line in the in the proof of the last lemma uh, where we uh, where we where we established this. So um, assumption A two is that for arbitrary U L this is greater than or equal to zero, and assumption A one is that this is greater than or equal to zero. But they're the same thing. So assumption A two has to hold if and only if assumption assumption A one holds. Okay, so this is greater than or equal to zero if and only if this is greater than or equal to zero, which is essentially assumption A1. Now, we didn't write it exactly like that. We wrote it by moving this piece to the other side. And so we wrote it as, well, let me go back to it. So what does this guy look like in our original incarnation? It looked like that. So seven is our assumption A1. Went a bit too far. And that's exactly that guy. All right. So knowing that, let's, um, well, I see. Uh, yeah, we will use exactly that assumption A2. Um, so um, suppose that uh, we're looking at the multigrid algorithm where M1 and M2 are equal to a common value called M. Then we're gonna prove that for all L between zero and capital L, that EL is exactly equal to its own adjoint. So this is what we mean by self-adjoint. And of course, this it goes without saying that we mean this with respect to the energy inner product on level L. So that's gonna be AL. So let's show that that's uh, um, self-adjoint with respect to that inner product. If, if in addition, assumption A1 holds or equivalently A2 holds, then we can also show that this energy matrix, this, um, this is exactly the energy or the the air sorry I said energy but error matrix error transfer matrix so we can show that this error transfer matrix is um, now we know it's self adjoint but we can also show that it's positive semi definite with respect to the energy norm or the energy inner product okay so it's self adjoint always just by the definitions as long as we have m1 and m2 being balanced. It's additionally going to be um, positive semi-definite in the energy inner product uh, if we assume that we have either the weak Galerkin assumption A1 or its equivalent in A2. Now, we already know 
that assumption A0 implies assumption A1. Assumption A2 is equivalent to A1. So that means that assumption A0 is a stronger assumption to assume. We can assume that, and it's going to also prove the same result that we want. Okay, so basically we're showing that the energy, or the, I keep saying energy, but I mean to say error, that the error transfer matrix is self-adjoint and positive semi-definite with respect to the energy inner product. Okay, so the proof is by induction as most things are in this um, in subsequent chapters because we're dealing with all these complicated levels. The base cases are and turn out to be rather easy to deal with. And that's because in the case L equals zero, we, we basically have a triviality because our entire algorithm is just um, involves um, inverting the stiffness matrix at level L zero. And we showed in that case that the error transfer matrix is just equal to the zero matrix. So the, 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 the zero matrix is, is trivially um, self-adjoint and positive semi-definite. Now, what about the L equals one case? Well, that is just exactly the two grid algorithm. And we showed that uh, in a proof um, in, a, in a previous chapter. I, be, I believe that was chapter two where we showed that. All right, so here's our induction hypothesis then. Um, remember, we're, we're showing the, the, the self-adjointedness first. So or the self-adjoint property first. So at level L minus one, let's assume that this error transfer matrix is indeed self-adjoint in the AL minus one inner product. So that means if I move this guy over to the other side, remember it picks up a star every time you do that. So it's gonna be EL minus one star, but we're gonna show that that guy, when it moves over and picks up the star, it's actually itself. So that's what we mean by saying that it's self-adjoint. Um, and furthermore, let's assume um, that, well, well, we'll need this part for our um, positive semi-definiteness case. And so for this one, we're also in, in addition assuming that either A1 or A2 also holds, the weak Alerkin assumption holds. So this is the assumption of positive definiteness on the level L minus one in the AL minus one inner product. Okay, so these are the two assumptions that we're going to use for our induction hypothesis. All right, so let's talk about now the general case. For that, we're going to need explicit definitions of the pi L minus 1 and the pi L tilde matrices. So pi L minus 1 matrix is, by definition, A L minus 1 inverse R L minus 1 times A L. So if we multiply um, both sides of this equation by AL minus one, then that kills off that guy. And so we get AL minus one, pi L minus one is RL minus one AL. Okay, so that's a little identity that we're gonna put in the back of our pocket and recall for later. And of course, uh, the pi L tilde matrix is just equal to the pi L minus one matrix, except that we're pre-multiplying by the projection matrix or the prolongation matrix. So of course we get this as our, our definition. Sometimes I call that the para definition, P-A-R-A. -A. All right, so this one is a long and painful proof. It's actually not as painful as it looks though, because all we're going to do is definition, 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 or property, property, property. And each step is just a little increment. So I could have said, you know, just prove it, or I could have skipped a, a lot of steps, but we're not skipping any steps here. We're, we're going to write it all out in gory detail, and we'll see that it all comes out just by doing one little step at a time. So the first thing to do is to input the definition of our error transfer matrix. So that guy is our error transfer matrix. So this is the post smoothing step, pre smoothing, and then this is the error in the coarse grid. Uh, yeah, the, the coarse grid correction, okay, for the multi grid case. 
All right, and notice that we're using an arbitrary UL and an arbitrary VL. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to move this KL star to the other side in this AL inner product. Well, notice it's starred. So each one of these, as it moves over to the other side is gonna be a, a gain a star. So we're gonna get a star of a star but that's just the original thing back. We showed that, that we showed that in an exercise. So, and notice also that our smoothing is balanced in the pre and post smoothing steps. We're, we're taking M1 and M2 equal to M. So I'm gonna move M of these guys over to the other side. And as I do each one of those, I get a star of a star and that gets me back to the original matrix. So that's why this moves over as a KLM. All right, so the next thing I want to do is I'm going to multiply out this PL minus one matrix. And if I do that, just uh, using the distri distributive property here, I get all of this matrix. Okay, so everything is distributed out. All right, next thing I want to do is I want to split this um, inner product using the linearity of the first component of the inner product. And I'm gonna split it right at this step right here, at the plus, okay? So everything from here over is gonna go here. And this guy together with this and this are over here. So that's just linearity of the inner product. All right, so what's next? What What's next? Let's look at this guy. I believe this guy is not going to change for a few steps. We're gonna keep that intact okay so from here to here nothing changes but what about going from here to here well this guy now notice this is by definition the pi l tilde matrix okay p l minus one pi l minus one is just pi l tilde so this one actually is just a redefinition or using a definition so that's otherwise the same. And this guy, as I said, did not change in going from that line to that line. Next, I'm going to use the fact that this guy here is self-adjoint. And remember, it's self-adjoint even if I don't have the Glurkin condition. So I can move it over to the other side. So let's remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to show that the whole thing is self-adjoint. So we're moving a little bit at a time over to the, to the right-hand side. All right. So self-adjoint property of this guy gets us there. What are we doing in this stage? In this stage here, um, it looks like what we're doing is bringing the AL matrix inside, and we're going to use the definition of the AL inner product. So I can bring it to either this side or that side when I bring that inside, and I'm going to bring it here, okay? So notice that AL is symmetric and positive definite in the L inner product. So I can move it back and forth without gaining a transpose uh, at will. All right, now this guy doesn't change in going from this line to this line. So those are all the same. So I'm only doing some manipulations on these guys now. All right, so the next step is when I move this prolongation over to this side, it comes over at, with a transpose, but the transpose is by definition the restriction. Also notice that I'm ratcheting the inner products here. Okay, so the reason is because this prolongation and restriction operators are not square matrices. So when they ratchet over, they change the, the inner products. Okay, so uh, successfully moved that guy over. What's next? So the next thing to notice is that this product matrix RL minus one AL is just AL minus one times pi L minus one. That was just this simple identity here. Okay, otherwise I'm not changing anything. All right, so now we're gonna pick up on the next page with some more manipulations. Okay, so I think what we've done here is, let's see. So now I'm gonna pull this guy out. This matrix I'm gonna pull out here. 
using the definition of that inner product. What am I doing in this for this guy? Nothing. We're leaving him the same. That's good. All right. So let's go on. So I think all in, in this whole column, we're not doing any manip manipulations with these matrices now in what is left. We're only going to manip manipulate these guys on the on this uh, this right hand term. So I just brought down or brought out this uh, stiffness matrix to make an energy inner product. And now I'm going to move some stuff uh, from one side to the next. So what about this guy? This guy is the product of a bunch of self-adjoint um, error transfer matrices at the level L minus one. I'm going to bring each one of those guys over, okay, one at a time and attach them to this side. So each one is self-adjoint, so the, the, pro the product of P of them, so this means raised to the P power. Each one of those comes over, it's self-adjoint, and so we get EL minus one to the P power over on the right-hand side. All right, next. I'm gonna move this guy back into, into this uh, calculation right here by the definition of the AL minus one inner product. Of course, once I do that, then I'm gonna use that little uh, identity again that AL minus one, pi L minus one is RL minus one AL. Okay, this side didn't change. Now I'm gonna move this RL minus one over to the right-hand side. That becomes a PL minus one and I ratchet the inner product from L minus one to L. Finally, I can yank this guy out, pull him out. All right, I get that. And now the next step is I'm gonna use the linearity of the left-hand side. So notice that I have a KL, MUL here, same thing there. So I'm gonna use the linearity on this term. And I, I do skip a couple of steps here because uh, when I do that, I get something which looks like when I combine these two terms, something that looks an awful lot like this whole thing again, that ugly thing. But I'm, not, I'm gonna skip that step. And then finally, I take this guy and I move it, once I get that combined object in each one of these positions, and I move it over to the uh, right-hand side. When I do that, what you'll see is that everything that I moved over is just going to give me the EL matrix, the error transfer matrix at level L, and I'm in the AL inner product. Well, remember, by definition, this guy moves over to the right-hand side and picks up a star, but I've just shown that if you move it over to the other side, that it doesn't have a star. So that precisely means that EL star is just equal to itself. So that's the self-adjoint property or the symmetry property that I wanted to show. All right, so notice that so far I've only used what? I've only used the definitions of the pi L minus one and the pi L tilde matrices. I've used a bunch of properties of inner products. I've used properties of the um, restriction and prolongation matrices. And, and most importantly, I've used my induction hypothesis that this guy is uh, symmetric, or I should say self-adjoint in this AL minus one inner product. So that's all I've used so far. And that gives me the symmetry that I want. I have not yet used any of the Glurkin assumptions, so that's what I want to use next. So we haven't used assumption A2, only the definitions of pi L minus one and pi L tilde. And those the properties and those definitions are always assumed to hold. Now in the last calculation, um, if you look at this, let's see, I wanna make sure I'm using the right line. I think it's this line right here. But I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to move it back over to the other side. And then I'm going to change UL and VL so that they're the same calculation. And that essentially is this calculation here. Okay, so that was the, the term on the left. 
and the term on the right is this guy here. Okay, so assumption A2 guarantees that this guy here is greater, greater than or equal to zero. That's exactly assumption A, A2, where the thing that I'm using in, in the definition of that assumption A2 is it just has a generic vector here like VL, but it doesn't matter what that vector is. I'm going to um, use, let's see, how, how does it look in my assumption A2? So assumption A2, it has a UL here. I'm gonna I'm gonna re redefine that as be something like VL. Okay, because I've already got a UL here. So I'm just taking this to be something like VL is defined as K L M U L. And that, that's what becomes my generic vector. In any case, assumption A2 states that if I have a VL here and here, and it's otherwise arbitrary, then it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, this is my assumption or my induction hypothesis here. This matrix, okay, I'm assuming that EL, I already know that it's self-adjoint. And I'm assuming that this matrix, let's say with a VL, in AL minus one, I've got one too many commas here. Is positive semi-definite. Now, what if I take this matrix and I raise it to the p power? Is this still true? The answer is yes. Still going to be true that I have a positive definite matrix in this sense. So my induction hypothesis was that this guy is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, if I have a VL and a VL here, then this is um, positive semi-definite. I didn't put the P here, but I can put the P here. Doesn't matter, right? So no matter what these things are here, as long as they're the same things, okay, this just becomes a VL, let's say an arbitrary VL, pi L minus one, K L M U L. So that gives me an arbitrary vector in this position, in this position. In any case, my induction hypothesis is that um, this should be uh, positive semi-definite. So the sum of these two things being positive or non-negative means that, uh, well, these two individual things being uh, non-negative means that their sum is not negative. And so this proves the result. So let's uh, go back to the statement of it to make sure we understand or are clear what, about everything. As long as M1 and M2 are have a common value, then the error transfer matrix for my generic multigrid algorithm is uh, self-adjoint. If in addition, A1 holds or equivalently A2 holds, then I can also assert that the error transfer matrix in the energy inner product is self-adjoint positive semi-definite. Okay, so remember in... 571, 572, we would have abbreviated this as symmetric, uh, positive, semi-definite, something like that. But we can't use symmetric anymore because it's not really symmetry. It's self-adjointedness, positive, semi-definite. Okay, self-adjoint, positive, semi-definite. All right, so that's a nice property to have for our error transfer matrix. So I just want to point out and something that I'm going to defer to a homework problem, and that is we use the fact that um, if we had the error transfer matrix being positive semi-definite, I 
I guess I should use an L minus one there. So that's the assumption that we have this guy being positive for any arbitrary vector or non-negative for any arbitrary vector u l minus one in the a l minus one in our product. Well, it still holds true if we put a positive power, positive integer power p there. So the homework problem that I've that I have in the in the in the lecture notes actually asks you to prove this. And then it asks you a, a related question, which says that, well, okay, it's true as long as p is a positive integer power. Is it also true if p is any power? So any positive power. So that would be even like, would it would it still be true if p is a like a half or something like that? So is it true for any positive power? It's true for positive integer powers. Is it true for any positive power? All right. So that. Uh, concludes our little section on the Galerkin condition. So we've gone through the basic building blocks of multigrid. Um, we talked about the Galerkin condition and then these basic uh, assumptions, A0, A1, A2. A1 and A2 turned out to be uh, equivalent. A0 was a stronger assumption, which is why we call it the strong Galerkin condition. Now we want to go into the next two properties that we need to analyze the convergence of our multigrid algorithms. Namely, the strong approximation properties, or the approximation properties, and the smoothing properties. All right, so um, as you saw with the Glurkin condition, there are strong and weak Glurkin condition assumptions. There are also strong and weak um, approximation property assumptions that we can make. We say that the multigrid algorithm satisfies the strong approximation property, assumption A3. If and only if for any and all UL in RNL, we have IL minus pi L tilde UL measured in the canonical norm L, level L norm. This is just the two norm on level L. If I square that, it's less than C3 squared um, rho L minus one. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second what rho L minus one is, times the norm of I L minus pi L tilde, I L minus pi L tilde times U L, measured in the energy norm squared, where this rho L is precisely equal to the spectral radius of the stiffness matrix at level L, okay? Otherwise, this this constant that appears out in front here is, well, there, there's, a, there's a definite level L dependence here, but C3 is completely independent of L. That's the important, or one of the most important parts. If you go back into the previous chapter, chapter four, we um, established something, an inequality like this. In fact, we established it as an equality but generally speaking, it's going to be established as an inequality. Um, we, we established that in chapter four in order to prove the abstract convergence, the energy uh, norm convergence of the two grid algorithm. Well, um, here we're, we're going to recognize that we don't need that as an equality. We simply need this inequality to hold in order to prove the things we want to prove. So this is what we're going to assume. Um, as I said before, it's really hard to say what this means physically or what this means practically. But when we get into the next chapter, chapter six, and we start talking about the finite element method, I'm going to show you that, that this has a connection to the basic error estimates for the um, finite element method. So that's going to have to wait until we get there. Um, to we, when 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 we we talk about the the Ritz projection and the finite element uh, projection operator, when when we get there, we're going to talk about this guy again, and, and you'll see exactly where it comes from. For now, we're simply going to call that the strong approximation property. We say that the multigrid algorithm satisfies the weak approximation property, or equivalently, assumption A four. 
if and only if for all UL in RNL that we have this inequality holding. Okay, IL minus pi L tilde, quantity times UL, UL in the AL inner product is less than C4 squared over the spectral radius of the stiffness matrix at level L times ALUL in the canonical norm L squared. This guy here, um, you may remember A L U L L. This was what we defined, or what we showed is just equal to the double energy norm. All right. So um, this, as I said before, looks like the Sobolev or has the same weight as the Sobolev H2 norm. And this is related to the fact, or is gonna be associated to the fact that when we do this, when we do the finite element error estimates, we're going to be using an H2 norm uh, to measure the error estimates. But again, it's a little bit hard to explain what this means in practical terms. Now, we're, we're simply gonna give it this, this sort of arbitrary and strange title, the weak approximation property. The important po point here is that C4, again, is gonna be completely independent of L. Of course, the, the spectral radius can depend on L. We've seen pr plenty of examples like that, but this part does not have an explicit dependence upon L. Now, what we wanna show is what the sort of similar things that to, to what we showed previously, that the strong approximation property implies the weak approximation property. So you might ask yourself, well, if the strong approximation property always implies the weak or the strong whatever property always implies the weak whatever property, why do we include both of them? Well, the reason why is because in some methodologies and some uh, applications of the multigrid method, we cannot show the strong version. All we can show is the weak version. But the good news is, even if we can't prove the strong version, we can still prove the convergence of our algorithm because the strong, well, the weak is really all that we need to prove the, the, the thing that we want. So that's going to, that's going to appear again and again. So again, the strong will usually imply the weak version of a property, but it's only the weak property that we're going to need to prove the result. All right, so if the Galerkin condition assumption A0 holds, then A3 implies A4. If the Galerkin condition assumption A0 holds, then A3 implies A4. Now, you might need something in addition, like for example, you might need the Galerkin condition to show that A3 actually implies A4, but usually it's only assumption A4 that's needed for the conversion, for, for, the, for the proof of the results that we want. All right, so let's try to show this. So since assumption A0 holds, we know that I L minus pi L tilde is a projection matrix. Okay, so, and that followed from the fact that if the strong Galerkin condition holds, then pi L tilde is also a projection matrix. If I multiply it times itself, then I get the thing, same thing back. Remember, um, it's based on, just based on the definition of the object, we know also that pi L tilde, for example, is its own adjoint. So in other words, it's self-adjoint. But that doesn't require the Glurkin condition. Only The only thing that requires the Glurkin condition is the second one. And of course, once we have that, then that implies this. All right, so let's see how this works. So let's look at the, so what we want is um, 
let's see, we're gonna let's see, we're gonna we assume that we have the strong approximation probability. Somehow we're gonna try to get this guy. So we're gonna start off with this object here. All right. So if we start off with this object, by definition of the energy inner product, we just have this, right? Energy inner product. Um, remember uh, the norm, as always, of let's just say any W because this is a vector. That's just equal to W L W L energy inner product, right? If I take the norm squared, I just get the energy inner product of the thing with itself. So that's the first thing that I'm using. Now, I'm going to bring this guy over to the other side. And remember, as it comes over, it picks up a star. So it doesn't matter if you move from the left to the right or the right to the left, you're going to pick up a star generically when you do that. But I know that um, the IL minus pi L tilde matrix is um, self-adjoint in the AL inner product. And so when I bring it over, the star disappears. And so I just have the same matrix multiplied by itself. Now I can use the fact that this is a projection matrix and I can lose that square. All right, so the square goes away. I just get this guy. Now I'm going to use the definition of the AL in a product. I just move this AL into, I can move it either here or here, wherever I want. Now I cannot move it necessarily in between these two matrices. It has to go into on the front. So the AL goes in the front of this guy or the front of this guy, you pick. So I'm going to move it to the front on the right hand side. Now I'm going to use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So Cauchy-Schwarz works for the um, canonical inner product, and it also works for the energy inner product. So remember what Cauchy-Schwarz says that it says that um, if I have this inner product, then that inner product is less than the norm of the first thing times the norm of the second thing. And I have to use the same norm that's generated by the inner product. So Cauchy-Schwarz says that this product or this inner product is less than this norm times that norm. Now I can use A3. So A3 says something about the size of this guy. So let's turn back for a second. A3 says something about the size of that guy. All right, without the square, it's gonna, we just have to take square roots of everything that we see over here. Okay, so Kind of just, just going to take square roots, C3, row L, that was to the minus one power. I have to take the square root, so it's minus one half power. And I also have this guy. It was squared. Take the square root. I lose the square here. This guy I'm leaving unchanged. And now I can use my cancellation property. As long as this guy inside is not equal to zero, I can cancel this one power with one of these powers over here. Now, the only way that doesn't work is if you're dividing by zero, but that would mean that the thing inside is already the zero vector. And so we can exclude that case. So cancellation says that we have this. Now, the next step is let's square both sides. If we square both sides, and use the fact that this is, again, a projection matrix, then we just have this. Okay, so there's a, a little step that goes, uh, you know, when you square this guy, um, you have to use the fact that uh, IL minus pi L tilde is a matrix or is a, is a projection um, in order to get a single one here. So because normally when we square this, we would have this product, this matrix would appear in both locations, but again, because it's a projection, then we can move it back to the other side. Square would go away, and we're just left with that. In any case, this is exactly uh, the assumption that we want. This is assumption A4, the weak Galerkin assumption.
or the sorry, not the weak alert, but the weak approximation property. And notice that whenever we can assume that um, that the strong approximation property holds with a constant C3, then this constant that we get for the weak approximation property, which we called C4, is exactly the same as C3. Okay, You get the result with C4 equal to C3. All right, so that's the strong uh, and the weak approximation property. So we've covered the uh, strong Galerkin condition, the weak Galerkin condition, um, strong and weak approximation properties. The next property that we want to cover is the smoothing property. So whenever we prove the convergence of the two-grid algorithm, we use all three of these properties, the Galerkin condition, the approximation property, and the smoothing property. We didn't give we didn't go into the details of proving or stating the weak versions of the, those approximation properties. We didn't need to. Um, and so uh, now we're, we're, we're giving the weak versions as well, because as I said, when we prove the um, convergence uh, results that we want to prove, we won't need to assume the strong versions. All right, so the next section is covering the smoothing property. As I said, we covered the Galerkin, strong and weak Galerkin conditions, the strong and weak approximation properties. The next component we need to prove the convergence of the multigrid algorithms is the smoothing property. So this one, um, we are only going to provide one flavor of it. So rather than have a full um, complement of strong and weak uh, smoothing properties, we're just going to do the simplest version of this. And we're going to use uh, Richardson smoother as our base smoother. Later on, I'm going to talk about using the uh, the Gauss-Seidel method as a smoother and uh, how we can prove convergence if we have that as a smoother as well. Um, ba basically, I'm going to establish these these smoothing properties or the smoothing property that we want to satisfy. And we're, we're, we're going to show that uh, the gauss L method will satisfy that property. Um, right now, we're just going to use the, the sim uh, a simpler tool, and that's the Richardson smoother. So the Richardson smoother goes this way. If I want to uh, solve an equation which looks like this, ALUL equals GL. GL is the given forcing function. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be generic because uh, the reason uh, for being generic is that when we use the multigrid algorithm, this is not just going to be F anymore. This might be something different. So suppose we want to solve this equation, and we want to use Richardson's method for uh, an approximation scheme. So of course, that's a general linear iterative scheme defined according to this prescription. I just have to tell you uh, what omega to choose. So it's very simple. It's, uh, it's going to be a, as a standalone solver, it's going to be very slow to converge. Um, but remember, as a component for multigrid, it's it's a kind of an integral component, and it it achieves, uh, as we saw in chapter three, it smooths the error out in such a way that we can then project or push the error to the coarse grid, et cetera. So this is. Um, this very simple method can be carried on even in this abstract framework. So this is the method uh, explicitly, and the iterator matrix for um, Richardson's method, at least in this carnation that we're using here, is just going to be omega times i. So to fully specify what or you know, to fully specify the method that we want to use, all that we need to do is tell you what the omega we should use. So for now, or to begin, omega is just some positive parameter. The error oh, transfer, go ahead. Was. Sorry, I think I downloaded an earlier version of the slides. In mine, it says omega inverse. Is it definitely omega and not omega inverse? I believe it should be omega. Uh, okay. And Thank and yes, you. an earlier version of the slides I had it uh, uh, um, incorrect. Okay, so Thank it, you. It's not it's not incorrect. It simply was presented in a way that wasn't uh, so helpful. 
So when I went back to chapter one, I changed it from omega inverse to omega, and then I had to change it everywhere um, going forward. And the first iterations of the slides that went out was with omega inverse there. So okay. I corrected that to omega. And Got I believe that, yeah, I believe that should be correct. In any case, um, uh, whether it's omega or omega inverse, the error transfer matrix looks much the same. It's just going to be I minus the iterator matrix, whatever that is. In this case, it's omega I times AL, All right? And it's easy to see that this matrix, this uh, error transfer matrix for smoothing is self-adjoint in the energy inner product AL, generated by AL, All right? So... KL, in other words, is just equal to KL star. All right. Um, now, for our definition of Richardson smoothing, we're going to use the same or a fairly similar technique to what we used in chapter uh, four. So we're going to choose an omega L, uh, a number, positive number, which satisfies the following estimate. It should be bigger than the spectral radius of the stiffness matrix on level L, so bigger than that, but not too big. So what I mean by not too big is it should fit between uh, rho L and some small constant times rho L. So previously we showed in chapter four that we could take um, lambda L Lambda L could be exactly an asymptotic uh, upper bound for this um, spectral radius. So we could satisfy this equation with CS being equal to, let's see, uh, any basically anything. It could be like 1.1, 1 .1, some, something where CS is, is fairly small. Now, we can't often, we're not able to use it with CS equals to exactly one, okay? so. We're, we're going to hedge our bets then and just say CS should be some number which is greater than one, strictly. But we want it to be small. That's the idea. Because if it's not small, then our estimates are get out of whack. So the idea is we don't want this guy to be like 10 times larger than rho L or 100 times larger than rho L. We want it to be something like 1.5 times larger than rho L, all right? So that the CS number here can be fairly small. That's the idea. So basically, that's a that that that's like saying that um, lambda l is asymptotically equivalent to rho l. That's that's another way of kind of saying it. Again, the CS is some number which is greater than one, which is level level independent independent of l. Rho al is the spectral radius of al, and what we're going to do is in our Richardson smoother, we're going to choose omega equal to one over uh, lambda L. And if I would have defined uh, this differently by using omega equals uh, or, or or using omega inverse here rather than omega, then I would have just taken omega equals uh, lambda L. Exactly. Because in, at the end of the day, I want the Richardson smoother to have this exact form. I want the error transfer matrix to be, well, Okay, so I want my B matrix to be one over lambda L times I L, okay? And that means that my error transfer matrix then is just gonna be this matrix. And of course, as we already specified or said for Richardson smoother, um, it's, it's always self-adjoint in the um, energy inner product. And by the way, it's always self-adjoint as long as this uh, iterator matrix is symmetric in the canonical inner product, as it is here, of course. It's symmetric because it's just subconstant times uh, the identity matrix. All right, now on to our first smoothing property. Of course, um, we don't use uh, uh, the strong smoothing property and weak smoothing property, but we will eventually possibly um, 
and and I say only possibly because I I may or may not include the this to, this topic in the course. I, I don't know yet, but but um, I'm I'm still trying to plan it out. But there there is this concept of first, second, and even third smoothing properties. Um, so they they don't use weak and strong, but they do use um, these basic qualifications: first, second, and third. So the one that the only one that we're going to need for our basic multigrid algorithms is the first smoothing property. That's what we call assumption A5. So we say that the multigrid algorithm satisfies assumption A5, the first smoothing property, if and only if the error transfer matrix KL raised to the m power m is uh, just some number. Okay, so it's, a no, it's, it's related to the number of smoothing iterations that we do. Okay, so this measured in the double energy norm, AL squared, double energy norm, is less than a constant, C5. So the nice thing about uh, this numbering system, by the way, is that the assumptions all get numbered, zero up to six or seven, something like that. And they'll all or most all of them have constants, many of them at least, have constants associated to them, and the constants carry the same number. So it's easy to track what assumption is giving rise to what constant. Okay, so if you see a C6 uh, floating around or a C5 floating around, that's associated to assumption A5 and A6 respectively. So this should be less than that constant C5, which is uh, independent of L. That's another a key point that I want to make in all of this. Whenever we make these assumptions, um, especially the ones that involve um, these inequalities with constants, the constant is going to be always independent of level L. And we try to introduce the level dependence through something else like uh, uh, an H parameter, or as we're doing it here, through the size of the spectral radius. Okay, so C5 square root of the spectral radius um, divided by the square root of m times the energy norm of ul. Otherwise, ul is completely um, is completely uh, arbitrary. Notice that we don't have to do this for level 0. Uh, and because, that's because on level 0, you don't do smoothing. You only do smoothing on levels one up to capital L. You don't do smoothing on level zero. So there's no zero uh, uh, recorded here. All right, so the last theorem of this slide deck then says that Richardson smoother satisfies the first smoothing property, assumption A5. So, I'm going to leave this proof as an exercise to you guys, the readers, and that's because it follows exactly the same proof that was given in um, in chapter four. So when we were when we were trying to prove the energy norm convergence of the two grid algorithm, we used the Galerkin condition, the strong approximation property, and the smoothing property. And the smoothing property that we wanted to establish is exactly of the same structure here. So we've already basically proven this. We needed a little technical lemma to get there, to prove it. And, um, and, and the reason we needed that specific form of the technical lemma is because we we're using Richardson's method. If we're using any other method, then we've got to and we want to establish a first smoothing property like this, we may have to use some other technique to prove it. But it was that key technical lemma that we used in chapter four to prove that Richardson smoother satisfies the smoothing property. And the same proof works here. There's just nothing else to do. All right, so I'm going to go on to the second slide deck of chapter five. And I believe that I uploaded these to um, uh, Canvas earlier today. So uh, if you are looking through these, you should have the same uh, deck of slides that I have. But let me know if, if for, for some reason they're not. They should be the same. 
All right. So again, we're in chapter five, talking about the basic building blocks of the multigrid method. This is the first time we're talking about the generic multigrid algorithm. And in there, we had, of course, uh, we saw that the, the generic multigrid alg algorithm can come in this flavor called the W cycle and the V cycle. So now we want to prove that these various flavors of multigrid um, actually converge. And so all we don't need to know anything about anything. It, it, we don't need to have any connection to um, a finite element method, a finite difference method, nothing like that. We, we're doing this completely in an abstract setting so that when we come back to chapter six, and even chapter seven, when we talk about finite differences again, um, all we need to do is confirm that we uh, satisfy these various properties. And if the, and if our method does, then we get the convergences for free. That's the basic idea. So the first thing I want to do is revisit the convergence of our two grid method. Um, remember, if we if capital L is equal to one then we have the two grid method. If L is equal to zero, this is just this is just the solution by inversion. Right? But L equals one, that was the two grid method. So um whatever is saying should work for these two cases to prove that these two sort of more trivial cases converge. Well, this one, we don't have to do anything because this algorithm is so trivial um, that it has to converge. You're multiplying by the inverse. And so you have to converge in exactly one step. Two grid method we already reviewed in chapter four, but now we're using slightly weaker assumptions. And I want to show you uh, so, so in chapter four, we were still uh, using the finite element method as our bedrock. Um, here, we're completely uh, away from any kind of description about any discretization method. This is simply uh, assumptions that we're making about the uh, this family of stiffness matrices. And so we're going to prove these convergences completely separated from any kind of uh, partial differential equation that we want to solve or discretization method. So we should be able to reestablish the two grid method convergence in this completely abstract setting. So let's do it. So suppose that L is equal to one, M1 is equal to uh, M and M2 is equal to zero. So this is the one-sided two grid method. Suppose that, um, Assumptions A0, the strong Galerkin condition, A3, the strong approximation property, and A5, the first smoothing property, all hold. So these are my generic assumptions that uh, we're using now, rather than any kind of assumptions associated to a finite element method or a P particular PDE. Then we can show that the error, remember this is the exact solution that we want to find on level one. This is our um, this is one application of the two grid algorithm using u one zero as an initial guess. It's less than c three times c five divided by the square root of m times the error between the true solution and that initial guess that we put into our two grid algorithm. So this is like the first iterate of two grid. Remember, the first iterate is generated by putting in the zero iterate and doing turning the crank. You get then u11. So for this to converge, then we want to show that this number here can be made smaller than one. Okay, smaller than one. Well, if we write this another way, um, and we let's see, yeah. And so we use this as a generic um, iterating method where we use, um, where we number this by k and k plus one, k and k plus one. Then in 
said in another way, then the error at k plus one is less than the error at k times this prefactor, which should be less than one. And how do we know that the prefactor is less than one? Well, c3 and c5 were constants, which were independent of levels. And so if we make m large enough, then this whole product is going to be less than one. And so that will that will guarantee that we have uh, the, the convergence that we're looking for. Again, if these are level independent, so they're independent of all the other parameters, and if m is chosen large enough, so and it's probably easier if you see it like this, c3 times c5 over the square root of m. Now, of course, I might have to make m equal to 100, right? And if m is equal to 100, square root of m is going to be 10, so that if I take c3 times c5 over 10, that number can be guaranteed to be t to be less than 1. We don't know what the size of that's going to be, but it should be small or smaller than 1 if m is large enough. Then that, and that's all that's all we really need. All right, for the present case, our error transfer matrix for the two grid method is just equal to I1 minus pi1 tilde times K1M. This is our pre-smoothing step, coarse grid roots um, projection, right? And so this is the error in the coarse grid roots projection. So error of coarse grid projection and the error in smoothing, that's the total error for the two grid method. So that's the relation that we get in our error transfer or involving our tra error transfer matrix or, or equivalently involving um, the, this uh, two grid operator. All right, when we proved A3 implies A4 in the previous slide deck, um, we, let's see, let's, uh, when we prove that A3 implies A4 in the slide deck, we also saw that A0 and A3 implied this. So we have to go back to the previous slide deck, and I don't have an easy way to go back there. So all I want you to do is kind of take my word for it that this holds. Right. So that was involved in proving that A3 implied A4. We showed that. A0 and A3 imply this. Okay, so that's the thing that we need to use to actually get this convergence that we want. All right, so here's by definition, the energy norm of E1 is just the error transfer matrix times E1K in the energy norm. And so this object here, we're gonna use now, or this, uh, this statement, that is appears in the previous slide deck, but we're not going back to it. Um, and we get this, okay? Right? So AL, of course, is just going to be A1 in this case, and L is equal to 1, okay? Because we're operating with the case that L is equal to 1. And notice that we get a, L, U, L, and L. So that's going to translate into A1. Whatever this vector is here, well, that's just going to be K1, M, E1, K. That just go, comes down. And A1 becomes a 1, right? And in front, we get C3, row 1, um, to minus uh, 1 half power. Right, so the next thing I want to apply is the um, the uh, condition A5. Condition A5 was our first smoothing property. So on that, we showed that this guy here is less than a constant. So all this stuff here. Well, first of all, let's see. So I'm gonna I can move this guy. Not sure why I didn't write it like that, but this guy here. I don't want to go back to that slide deck, but this can be, this guy can be brought out as the A1 squared norm. Remember the double energy norm here. And it's precisely that guy where we can operate on, or that we can use to operate on this error. So this comes down because of the, um, of this property. So that's the approximation property there. 
And now we want to apply the strong or the first smoothing property, and that's what releases this these constants. Okay, so the ones we just talked about. Well, notice that I get a cancellation of this term and this term, right? And all I'm left with is C3 times C5 uh, divided by the square root of M times the A1 norm of E1K. So this proves the result that we want. Um, C3 and C5 are just constants that are independent of L. The product is going to be a positive number. And I'm, I'm guaranteed that if I take enough smoothing iterations that the product or the quotient C3, C5 over square root of M is eventually going to be less than one. And so it's that number less than one, which guarantees that I have a contraction and guarantees that I have the convergence that I want. All right, so the next uh, in the next class, we're going to talk about the convergence of the W cycle algorithm, but I don't have enough time to get into that here. Um, there's, a, there's a few things that we need to um, establish first, a couple of uh, preliminary lemmas before we get into the convergence of the W cycle. It's all fairly complicated. After that, we're going to talk about the convergence of the simple symmetric V cycle. So in this case, we're talking about the algorithm where P is equal to one, M1 equals M2 equals one. That's what we call the simple or defined this as the simple symmetric V cycle algorithm. After that, we're gonna come back to uh, the convergence or we're gonna visit the convergence of the symmetric V cycle in the general terms. So in this case, P again is equal to one. That's what guarantees that we have a V cycle. And in this case, all we need to do is take M1 and M2 equal to each other, equal to some constant value M, not necessarily just equal to one. So in the simple symmetric, we take M1 and M2 equal to one. We take P, one, P equal to one, that gives us a V cycle. And for the general symmetric V cycle, we're going to want to show that we get convergence if we do more smoothing iterations. This kind of seems like a stupid uh, convergence because if I can prove the convergence for the uh, simple symmetric, then I should be able to prove the convergence for the general. But it's just that this proof um, actually shows something more. It shows that we actually get an improved convergence rate if we do more smoothing iterations. Of course, the W cycle algorithm involves taking P equals two or even, even uh, larger, P equals two or three or something like that. So we're gonna come back next time and show this convergence. That'll be the first thing we do. And we'll probably have enough time in the next lecture to prove uh, the convergence of the V cycle and this guy. And then uh, uh, the lecture after that, next Thursday, we'll uh, visit this uh, convergence of the general V-cycle algorithm. This one gets fairly complicated and lengthy, and we'll, we'll need to slow down and spend some time there. That's where I'll stop, and I can take any questions that you guys have.